watching AI TV. AI TV. Education is the key to unlocking your family's financial future. At Burlington Community Financial Center, we help families resolve their financial complexities by working with them to create clear and meaningful financial goals. Thanks to our unique educational platforms and financial workshops, families can begin to live debt-free and have enough money to secure their emergency fund and long-term savings. At Burlington Community Financial Center, our mission is to educate families and guide them to achieve their financial dreams. Contact us today to learn how to live financially independent. Welcome, welcome to you, Voice. Uh, this is again another Saturday, another episode uh, with me, uh, David Chilavida, together with... Judith Bukenya. Yeah, thank you, Judith. Uh, this has been a very wonderful week where we have lots of stories, lots of things happening back home in Uganda and here in the diaspora. We at You Voice, we promised you to bring you the current updates that are happening in the National Unity Platform, NUP, uh, with other political parties in Uganda, different things happening in the political sphere, uh, economic sports, all around, and also in Africa, because we believe in Pan-Africanism. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we look forward to having a great show. Uh, to you, Judy. Thank you. So a lot of our viewers and all of our people who are watching uh, would like to know, uh, are there any updates on the Lumbuye situation? Ah, currently, the, the few or the little updates that we can give our viewers uh, is that there is a team, uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, the, the news that has covered the whole, the whole uh, media world, Twitter, YouTube, and all social media, uh, is the news of the kidnap. We won't call it arrest because if uh, someone is arrested, uh, they are brought before the courts of laws and all that. But we will call it the kidnap of the famous uh, political activist, Kajubi Fred Lumbuye, who was kidnapped uh, like a week ago and is uh, being searched for all over. So a team, a delegation of uh, uh, lawyers from Uganda has gone to Turkey and to follow up with this case, and we have, uh, we, we saw Honorable Member of Parliament for Mitiana, uh, Honorable Francis Zake heading a team and a delegation to Turkey, and also we saw Council uh, and Honorable Member of Parliament for Chadondo, Honorable Muwadan Kunyinji, and also uh, Lawyer Attorney uh, were merely also joining the team and they have gone and they have touched base in Turkey and they are joined with the attorneys that side together with uh, our very own uh, Agnes Kaziba. Uh, we salute you, the legal team that are doing everything within their power to see that they talk and they negotiate and they do all this. And we have seen lots of fundraisings happening here in the diaspora, mm -hmm. lots of demonstrations and people are demanding for the release and it's uh, it's uh, who are has been alerting many of them and uh, they call him a prophet. He has been prophesying and speaking about things and they have been happening. He has been blogging and 
standing for the oppressed Ugandan. So that's the few updates that we can give you, but a lot is still unfolding. And as we get it, we promise to give it up to you. And we, we also want to thank all Ugandans who have been trading, uh, who have been uh, demonstrating, and those of you who have been fundraising. Thank you so much for all your efforts, and we will keep you updated on the latest developments. Thank you, Judy. Thank you for that update, David. And now I want to introduce our guest today. Our guest, his name is Fazil Mayanja. Fazil is a YouTuber. He is also a political activist and a Ugandan blogger out here in the diaspora. And so, Fazil, welcome to the show. We can't, we couldn't hear you. Oh, uh, now we can hear you. Oh, can you hear me now? Oh, sorry, I think it's just my speaker. I say that thank you for having me on your show, and uh, I'm happy to be with you here. We're glad. Uh, both David and Jude. We're glad to have you. All right. So, Fazil, I wanted to start off with, uh, first of all, again, saying thank you for being on the show. And given that you're a Ugandan blogger and also a critic of the Ugandan government, how has the um, the drama with um, with Fred Lumbuye impacted you, impacted other uh, YouTubers, other bloggers, other critics of the Ugandan government? How has that impacted you? Uh, well, uh, this did not come as a surprise because uh, everyone doing this kind of job, critiquing the government, whether overtly or covertly, it is something that uh, we really expect at some point in time. Because like ever since we started this kind of work a couple of years ago, uh, so many threats have been coming our way. Uh, some have been credible, some have been incredible, and that kind of stuff. But uh, what we have seen is that uh, this is Museveni's last ditch effort uh, to try to silence uh, social media. Because you will understand that uh, a couple of months ago, they tried to hack into uh, Facebook accounts as well as Twitter accounts, as well as trying to shut down YouTube channels. Uh, I remember very well, uh, a couple of months, uh, the government, uh, they, they wrote to YouTube as well as Facebook, asking them to take down uh, pages as well as taking down YouTube channels uh, of different individuals who they said that they were spreading or whatever false information and all, you know those kind of charges that they usually come up with uh they first a legal hurdle in terms of uh in the in the sense that they had to have a court order uh, to provide to these companies in order to close our channels but they did not succeed they did not succeed in that which was really ironic that they own the courts they make their laws and all this kind of stuff but they couldn't even make their own court order to actually provide to youtube as well as facebook in order to shut down the channels now, uh, when they failed in that particular attempt, uh, they tried to hack, not trying, but they actually hacked into all Facebook pages as well as mostly Facebook pages. And most pe Facebook pages were actually taken down and they were taken over by Museveni's charlatans. And these people started to post uh, pro NRM messages, posting whatever, because they even lacked what to post in terms of what Museveni has done for Uganda. But they started using these, uh, our platforms, to ask people to support Museveni uh, in one way or the other, and asking people to desist from standing up and demanding their particular victory. Now, given that all those ventures have actually failed, uh, so they decided to you know, go to the lowest of the low uh, to start carrying out kidnaps, <clears throat> especially in the diaspora, because we see that uh, the, the the clampdown on social media had also started when they arrested most of our comrades in Karangara, uh, who had gone there to, you know, who were moving with uh, His Excellency Robert Chagulani Sentamu, also known as Bobby Wayne, who were moving with his convoy that were capturing these events and these moments. Most of those guys were actually arrested and we lost a substantial amount of people who were blogging from Uganda. Mm -hmm. Some of them have not even recovered uh, from that particular uh, arrest. Now, it was only left with us in the diaspora, mostly uh, giving people updates and following stories here and there. So the last ditch effort that M70 has resorted to is to actually come over to the diaspora and try to uh, kidnap people and, you know, 
abduct them and all this kind of stuff, which is quite interesting. Now, the impact of that to the blogging community is that uh, whereas it has created, I wouldn't say that it hasn't created a bit of, it, it came as a shock, yes, uh, because we thought that you know seven would not be able to pull this off but uh, when you look into the situation that happened in turkey it is actually much more than uh, most of us do really understand because of the politics in turkey the, the the type of government and all this kind of stuff but the impact of all this it has actually increased uh, our resolve uh, to show that number one social media actually works because they claim that social media is just a, a group of people shouting, they are not on ground, they can't do anything, they can, you know, they have no impact. But the fact that you can go to the extent of hacking, extent of writing to Facebook to close down these platforms, and to an extent of actual abduction shows that really social media works. So that means that the strategy that we are handling or that we are doing is actually uh, hurting them, or it is actually, you know, it's really hurting them in, 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 a, in a really uh, important way that can really help us to expose Museveni and his regime. So all we, the only impact that I see is just, is, is just that we, we got to have to increase the pressure, uh, increase the demand for accountability, increase the demand for justice for our brothers and sisters who have been killed and all these sorts of demands and increase the demand for our victory that we had on January 14th at the beginning of this year. That's 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 very good to know that there are that there is a a deeper resolve to continue you know what they say putting the pedal to the metal yeah um, so for people who are in other countries outside of the U.S. Um, I'm not sure nor am I learned on the different um, constitutions of those different locations but for those of us here in the U.S. we have the First Amendment. Um, in the Constitution that allows for freedom of speech, um, as long as, of course, that speech is not, it does not induce terroristic attacks. So for people who are in other countries who um, may not have such liberties, um, what, what protections do they have there who are, if they're bloggers or they're YouTubers, what protections do they have there in those um, different parts of the world? Uh, of course, uh, it's quite it's quite risky uh, to be doing this kind of work in some countries because I also understand that uh, our our brother Comrade Lumbier was. You, you see, this is the sort of this is what really shows that people are really really yearning for change in Uganda mm -hmm. to extent that they can even work within dictatorial environments in order to you know to to to, to talk to fellow Ugandans in different parts of the world. But uh, what you raise is a very important uh, aspect. Uh, because uh, most of the people who are in uh, other countries, maybe like China, or Rwanda, or these other African countries where there is no protections of freedoms, freedoms of speech, there are so many other different uh, things that they can do. Uh, some of them they don't have because the work of blogging is quite interesting because it's kind of interlinked and interconnected in the sense that uh, what pushes us. We, we, the people who do this kind of work, it is the viewers. And what pushes the engagement? It is the comments, people who comment, as well as people who share uh, these particular videos. So people who are in these uh, areas or in these particular countries, they, there are so many other things they can do. They can tweet under pseudonyms without revealing their identities. They can comment. Uh, under different names, they can share under different names, they can do so many different other things. But we all know that uh, by bringing your face out and showing your face to the world, there's nothing you can hide. Like you, you have really blown your cover. You cannot come here and say that, oh, my name is David, or oh, my name is Jude, <laughs> you know, because like everyone knows who Jude is, everyone who's like your face is confirmatory evidence, you can't hide that. So that is like. Even if you go to the airport, they can easily arrest you and all kind of stuff. So for our brothers and sisters, uh, most especially uh, for the ones that have, I haven't seen many of them, of which this has actually managed to push the struggle much farther because most of them have been able uh, to work covertly uh, without showing their faces, without revealing their names, without revealing too much information about them, whereby they can easily uh, you know, do 
uh, activism, even if they're in Rwanda, even if they're in China, even if they're in any uh, different part of the world. But if at all they show their faces, now that's a completely different case. Mm -hmm. And the case of Lumbuye that we have seen, it means that uh, they have to be now extra careful because uh, anything can literally happen uh, today as we speak. Because uh, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy. I do understand. But what they can easily, what they can do is literally to to try to work over covertly. Uh, in one way or the other, if, if, if they can, for their own protection, until we can get on top of this particular situation. Wow, thank you. Well, uh, just uh, thank you so much, Fazel. Uh, from me, I just want to ask you, uh, despite all the persecution and all the intimidation, and uh, you've uh, once been branded to be propagandists or gossipers, uh, and very fierce intimidation now is happening as we see so what are some of the values that keep you pushing and going on as uh, activists? And what are some of the things that really inspire you to keep going, irrespective of staring at the brutal regime as we all know it? Uh, you know, what is interesting about this issue, this entire thing is that uh, most of Museveni's things are actually hidden in plain, in plain sight. Like, you don't have to look very far if I told you want to break down Museveni. Like, he always comes and brags about the roads they have built, they brag about the factories they have opened up and all this kind of stuff. But if you go and read through these, all these things, the roads they have built, and look at the cost of the roads, and then you compare with other countries where these same roads have been built, you see, like, it's really... He is actually indebting Ugandans. He is in, he's indebting us. He indebted our grandfathers, sorry, our, our parents. He's indebting us. He's indebting our children and our great great grandchildren. For example, if you look at the Entebbe Express Highway, the road, the amount of money actually it is the most expensive road in the world. I mean, you can look it up. And for that same amount, you could have got an eight lane road like the Chinese constructed in Ethiopia. So, all these kind of things, if M7 comes and speaks about peace and security in the country, I do not feel like Uganda is peaceful. I do not feel secure in Uganda. These are the things that are literally around us. If you're talking about the issue of education, COVID has actually, I mean, exposed the entire regime to the extent that they have no plan of, talk, of taking even children back to, 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 to schools. They, they literally have no plan. Because you cannot tell me that, okay, uh, you know, COVID is here, blah, 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 blah. But all of a sudden, for two years now, our kids are still in the same classes. We have a minister of education who was given that particular position just because of the relation that he has with Museveni, being the fact that she is the wife to Museveni. And that is what happens whenever you carry out nepotism in a state. Because you hire people who are not competent. You hire people, because when you hire people on nepotistic grounds, then meritocracy goes out from the other way. Because now people who would have had ideas on how uh, to, 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 to jumpstart the education system are now left behind. But you have a lady who is seated there, who is out of ideas. That's if she has even any. And I mean, these are the things that, there are so many things that I can try to talk about here. Um, if you look at issues like tribalism, Museveni is the biggest promoter of tribalism. And then he hides under the guise that, oh, no, 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 it is NUP that is promoting tribalism, it is so-and-so that is promoting tribalism, which is not true. Like, you can see the number of people who are working in his offices, the appointments that he makes. Right now, we are being ruled by decree. Uh, there is no PPDA procedures that are being followed in one way or the other. Every person who works in the, in the state house, most of the permanent secretaries, everyone who gets an appointment, they must be connected to Museveni in a particular way. So these things you cannot hide. If we sit down and try to, because some people may say, oh, yeah, yeah, Museveni has done something. He has done, okay, what has he done, literally? Because for a person who has really done something for their country, a person who has really done something, they should be empowering institutions, whereby if at all they leave power, these particular institutions will still be strong in order to ensure continuity of the next government, right? But if Museveni drops dead today, there is no, there is no one who can tell you confidently and say that, okay, there is a particular institution that will be working. Absolutely not. So for me, uh, when I look at these things, 
I, I, I'm sorry to say this, but to some extent, I even enjoy it because of the things that I'm actually uncovering. It is like a treasure mine. You know, you're, you're getting one treasure after one, one treasure after one. All of a sudden, the notes are connecting that we have been living in a lie for the past 35 years. A person who doesn't even know his names. Like, you cannot take that for granted. For 35 years, I'm not even 35, but for 35 years, this guy has been lying to us that his name is Yoweri Museveni. Now, all of a sudden, in 2021, he says that he is still Havura. His education and all this kind of stuff, all everything about him is a, is a scam. Literally, it's a scam. I mean, I don't know, but for me, I really enjoy the work that I do because I get to learn, understand, and unveil Museveni in ways that he has never been unveiled before. And most of the people have actually come to terms with this as well. Well, here in, 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 in different companies, we have who are called whistleblowers yeah. who, yeah. you know, they, they expose, as you said, who expose certain truths that other people, that most people either don't know or don't want to know about yeah. the workings of certain institutions or companies. So would you consider yourself an, a whistleblower of, the, of this regime? Uh, I think whistleblowers are people who work within the regime. Uh, for me, I actually do not work within the regime, but uh, 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 like I say, um, I'm an activist to, 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 to that extent uh, because, uh, uh, like so many, like I've said, these things are literally hidden in plain sight. Like even if you look at the Ugandan budget, nothing is literally working. There is mm -hmm. nothing that is literally working in our nation, in our country. Uh, the level of divide and, and a, a, a division that has been created in the state is actually, we are most likely to self-destruct as, as a country than to survive in one way or the other because we have been divided on religious grounds, we have been divided on tribal grounds, we have been divided on each and everything uh, in our particular country. We have the haves and the have-nots and all this kind of stuff. And it is really uh, setting a very bad precedent for Uganda and uh, we, we, we really have to fight so hard in order uh, to bring the country together and bandage it together and heal it together so that we can look at each other as one in terms of, you know, Ugandans, because the divisions are really, really, really deep uh, as we speak today. Like you can see the people from the West look at the people from the North in a different way. The people from the East look at the people from the Central in a different way. And as we see right now, the people in the no uh, North can look at the people in uh, in where in the central again in a completely a different way, and that has really really done so bad for our particular country, and it's really a sad time that we live in today. And the other thing that I, I also see that is really very detrimental to Uganda today is that we have even created not only Museveni has he created enemies within Uganda, but he has he has also created for us enemies outside Uganda, right. which is really bad. Uh, for your example, if you go to South Sudan, uh, if you go recently, I think last week, the, you got, this week, the people of the Ugandans in South Sudan were protesting because the government in South Sudan uh, said that they are going to be charging Ugandans $100 for visa renewals every month. $100 per month for visa renewals in Uganda. Wow. Sorry, for, for Ugandans living in South Sudan. So Ugandans in South Sudan had to go and protest at the Ugandan embassy, but I don't think anything has, has been done. But you can also uh, talk about our interventions in Somalia, talk about our interventions in Zaire, as well as Rwanda, Burundi, uh, 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 as far as now, I think, M M Mozambique. But then, uh, more of most recent, just last week or this week, you can also speak about um, seven is, uh, you know, poking into Kenyan in politics Kenya. once again in one way or the other. Which leads us to our, our, our second topic. Um, I wanna, and, and thank you for getting us there. Um, I love the fluidity of our conversation because we just, we get into a flow. Mm. So I want to go over next door to Kenya um, and actually discuss and, and look at how Museveni has been meddling in the politics of, of Kenya, the impact on um, Roto's uh, bid for uh, presidential election next year, um, and the, what, what also those impacts are. Is there a 2007 election um, repeat going to be happening again, given Kenya's relationship to Uganda? So take us over to Kenya and, and, and share with us what, is at, what actually happened that had Museveni 
uh, meddling over in Kenya's uh, politics? Uh, I, I think Kenya is a very interesting uh, situation uh, where we are today. And uh, we all understand that Museveni is is not happy, uh, or he will not be happy if at all uh, Raido Dinga takes power, or if anyone else other than Ruto takes power in Kenya. And that explains, uh, there's an article that was written, I think it was it in the East African, where they were explaining the reason as to why uh, Museveni never gave the oil pipeline to Kenya, because Kenya was the shortest route. Yeah, you know, the pipeline from uh, Western Uganda to Tanga Port it was actually given to Tanzania because Museveni wasn't sure that if, if, if Raino Odinga takes power in Kenya or anyone other than Ruto takes power in Kenya, uh, they can literally, <laughs> you know, block the pipeline and it can, you know, interrupt the flow of oil in Uganda, between U Uganda and the, you know, and the French and all these Chinese companies. So he was hesitant to give the Kenyans uh, the pipeline. But we also understand that when Museveni visited the Kenya, I think in 2019, he was booed at the University of Nairobi because of his treatment of uh, His Excellency Robert Chagulani Sintamu. And Museveni has never forgotten that particular s s incident because he's a person who has been peddling on semantics of being a Pan-Africanist, uh, just in words but not in action, by saying, oh, Africa this, Africa that, Africa this, Africa that, we as Africa, Africa, and all that kind of crap. And most of uh, people who are excited, they just, you know, run away with those words and say, oh, M7 is one of the best Pan-Africanists. But now he has been exposed and there is no country in Africa where he can go and, you know, rhyme with the same words and people can actually listen. And the same ha uh, happened in, at the University of Nairobi. But now what we see in the Kenyan politics is... Uh, the gentleman known as William Somei Ruto, uh, we, we understand very well that they are going for election next year. And of course, Museveni has him as a candidate. But way back in 2016, we understand that Ruto came to Uganda, in, indulged into Ugandan politics by campaigning for Museveni in, East, in the eastern part of Uganda. Like literally a vice president or a deputy president of Kenya coming to Uganda and then campaigning uh, for for, 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 for a, 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 a president, whatever, for a candidate next door. Isn't that thing? Um, because by then, Ruto was holding office. Mm -hmm. And then he's campaigning, he's indulging into the politics of Uganda, saying that Ugandans should vote from seven. So what we see is that Museveni is and Ruto, they, they go quite a long way. And we also understand that Ruto has been trying to, you know, uh, talk to Museveni to make sure that he promotes him in the East African region, amongst uh, Samia Suruhu of Tanzania. But we also knew that the predecessor to Samia Suruhu, the, the late John Pombe Mazgufuri, was anti-Ruto. And also, he cannot go to Rwanda because him and Kagame are at local heads. Maybe and Shimiye in Burundi, who is a great counterpart with Museveni, as well as South Sudan, of which South Sudan today, uh, the things are not really good uh, between Museveni and the South Sudanese. But uh, Ruto wanted Museveni to sell him in the East African region, and unfortunately, it did not work out. But on the other hand, while I was looking into this particular situation, uh, recently, uh, Ruto was blocked from coming to Uganda. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but a few, a, weeks, a few weeks early, uh, he had come to Uganda and launched a company known as, uh, I think, Bay pharmaceuticals. Now, Day Pharmaceuticals is uh, under a gentleman known as Dr. Charles Magola, as well as uh, some Pakistani patent rights gentleman. So they launched this company, and then Ruto went back. All of a sudden, a week later, we see that Ruto is being blocked from coming to Uganda with a terrorist known as Harun Aydin, a Turkish terrorist. A Turkish Kenyan branded terrorist, Aruna Ayadin, who is now deported uh, because he had, was coming for a private visit. Now, when I looked into the story, I realized that Ruto had financed the day pharmaceuticals with 150 million US dollars, a loan that they acquired from Equity Bank Kenya. Now, this particular loan was acquired in uh, around December 2019 to to help Day Pharmaceuticals to set up and all this kind of stuff. But we also know that Day Pharmaceuticals was bankrupt and it, its its books never actually added up. So why would Ruto actually vouch for a, a scam and a, a scam company like Day Pharmaceuticals uh, with, you know, towards Equity Bank uh, to lend them 150 million? 
Well, it all made sense because of the timing on when the loan was released, because we were heading towards elections. And it is likely that that 150 million is actually used in elections rather than setting up that vaccine fact that so-called vaccine factory that they want to set up in Matuga. Now, you should also understand that when Ruto came to Uganda in that particular week, the finance minister of Uganda, known as Matia Pasaija, went to the committee, in, uh, the, went to the parliament and asked for $14 million in order to help set up a vaccine facility. When the MPs uh, in the committee asked this gentleman, Matia Pasaija, that, okay, who, who are the people behind this this vaccine facility? Mm -hmm. Who are the people going to be manufacturing these vaccines and all this kind of stuff? Matia Kasaija could not explain. Matia Kasaija says that that is a secret. So now you're telling me that we should release fourteen million dollars, right? And you're telling me that there is this investor that is going to build a vaccine facility, right? But then you cannot tell me the name of the investor, but you still want the fourteen million. So what, for me, that only explains the fact that maybe Equity Bank wants back its money. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. uh, Chinyata, being uh, given the fact that Equity Bank is a Kenyan bank, Uhuru Chinyata is the president of Kenya, he is, of course, trying to twist William Ruto and his machinations through uh, Equity Bank by telling Equity Bank to demand William Ruto uh, the money that they lent him of course, paying it back in uh, a few installments here and there. But we also understand that William Ruto is cash strapped for his campaigns in the Kenyan presidential election because we know very well that uh, Kenyan elections are very, very expensive to run. And you really need a lot of money to run a Kenyan election. And we also understand that Uri, uh, sorry, William Ruto is really, really cash strapped on that particular front. And that is where actually M7 comes in. Now, what is interesting as I wind up this particular point, and maybe you can come in as well, what is interesting is the fact that uh, when William Ruto was blocked from coming to Uganda, um, Museveni's government released a statement saying that, no, 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 we hadn't invited Ruto. He was coming. We don't know on what grounds, but he's not our visitor. We are not prepared for him. That is all up to him. And that is, that is when William Ruto went on a re certain radio station in Kenya and revealed the entire information about the deal he made or the deal where he helped Day Pharmaceuticals uh, through a phone call that he made to each Equity Bank to be given 150 million US dollars. But I would be very stupid not to think or to think that Day Pharmaceuticals and Mr. Charles Magola would just be given a loan in a foreign country without the backing of a powerful person within Museveni's government. I also believe that on that phone call that Mr. Magola had with William Ruto, there was a third party that was listening in that was really powerful. And that third party is none other than Yori Kaguta Museveni. And that explains, or to me, in my own summary and conclusion, is that the loan of 150 million US dollars was not given to Dave Pharmaceuticals, but Dave Pharmaceuticals was just a conduit from 70 to attain the 150 million US dollars in order to run his 2020 campaigns against His Excellency Robert Chapman Setam. So now that the bank is asking for their money back, where did the money go and how is, the, how is Ruto to get the money back that he um, supposedly poured into this pharmacy or this pharmaceutical? Where is he supposed to get that money back? Well, uh, because like I've explained to you that uh, when Luto's recent visit, when they were launching the Dave Pharmaceutical uh, Facility in Matuga, the Minister of Finance, uh, one Matia Kasaija, had come and asked for money in the Ugandan government to build. That's why people have to follow that particular money of building vaccine facilities and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. That money is not going to build any facilities. They said that they were going to build a hospital somewhere in uh, Lugoa. Where did all that money go? And where did those investors go? So what they are likely, where Ruto is chasing for the money by pressuring Museveni to pay back the loan. It, of course, the loan has to not doesn't have to be paid back in a lump sum. But you know, you're supposed to be paying back installments at certain intervals in one way or the other. Mm -hmm. So what we understand is that the 14 million that Museveni was asked, because 150 million US dollars is a lot of money 
to actually, is, uh, it should be enough money to build a vaccine facility mm -hmm. because that is the money that they pharmaceutical has got. But by Matia Kasaija asking for 14 million US dollars, right, for a vaccine facility to be built, definitely they were asking for that money to be paid back to Equity Bank because Museveni spent the money on elections. If you can use you, both of you, Mr. Jude, Jude and uh, sorry, Judy and David, you can agree that the election was had a lot of money in it. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of money was spent in the election. Mm -hmm. And the, to, the, to make matters worse for them uh, is that after the elections, uh, they actually, uh, the economy did not get back to normal because of COVID-19 and all this, this kind of stuff. They were literally cash strapped, and we, we are still in the same bubble in one way or the other. Mm. So, Museveni is trying to collect money here and there from donors and all this kind of stuff, collect money through different programs under the guise of different programs in order to try to enable William Ruto. But what I see here is that uh, whereas Ruto was expecting money from Museveni to help with his campaign, uh, that is likely to be a very, very long shot. And I think. Uh, the elections in Kenya uh, are really going to be very interesting to watch on how Ruto can really turn this around. But his engagement with Museveni has already tainted his image because Museveni has been seen as a person who has destabilized the entire East African region. And Ruto is the same person campaigning for Museveni to become the leader of the entire East African Federation. And no one in Kenya, Tanzania, uh, South Sudan uh, can actually accept such a thing uh, to happen. And the backlash that the Museveni government has actually received from Kenya has been laughable because these people are even laughing at Ruto's own presidents that how can you really uh, tell us to, 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 to emulate the Ugandan democracy and to emulate Museveni's type of politics? The, the politics of brutality, the politics of human rights violations, the politics of corruption and all this kind of stuff. I mean, if that is what you wish for Kenyans, then Kenyans, trust me, they have now uh, shifted goalposts, especially with Ruto's engagement with Museveni. Something he would have stayed away from, and maybe it would have helped his campaign. But with that engagement, it has really tarnished his uh, campaign. Wow. wow, that's that's really wow. exciting, but uh, also very unfortunate news to hear. But thank you so much, Fazil, for that great, great uh, explanation. Uh, dear viewers, uh, the number to call in if you want to be part of this conversation is 978-413-6249. It's on WhatsApp, wherever you are, in whatever country you're in. Feel free to call us and we hear your thoughts. And if you have questions for Fazil, uh, he'll be happy to answer you. Uh, but we will go for a short break. And when we come back, uh, the number is 978 413 Six two four nine. We'll go for a short break and then we'll be back. Education is the key to unlocking your family's financial future. At Burlington Community Financial Center, we help families resolve their financial complexities by working with them to create clear and meaningful financial goals. Thanks to our unique educational platforms and financial workshops, families can begin to live debt-free and have enough money to secure their emergency fund and long-term savings. At Burlington Community Financial Center, our mission is to educate families and guide them to achieve their financial dreams. Contact us today to learn how to live financially independent. Multi-Professional Consultants is a client-focused tax consulting firm that specializes in tax and consulting services, accounting, bookkeeping and payroll services, investment and financial planning, documentation and notary public, 
Our team will take the confusion out of an overly complex tax system in order to give you the tools to succeed. We are be behind you, prepare your taxes, and to follow until you get the, the refund you deserve. And also if you have a problem, then we shall come to your defense. Allow us to handle all your financial needs. Contact multi-professional consultants today. 617-389-4417. Multi professional consultants is a client. You are watching AI TV. AI TV, connecting the diaspora. Come back from that short commercial break, and we are still here at the U Voice, and uh, we have our wonderful, awesome comrade, our political analyst, uh, blogger. He does many things, uh, our dear friend uh, Fazil Mayanja, giving us the latest updates and analyzing on the current affairs. Uh, back to you, Judy. Thank you. So we're going to get into our last topic of the day. We want to introduce um, one of the power players um, of the regime. Her name is, I'm going to pronounce her name properly, Mirjam Black So. Mirjam Black So. Mirjam Black So, I'm going to read a little bit from her resume. She's a Ugandan nominee for election uh, to the board of directors to the trust fund for the victims of international criminal court. She is an international lawyer with over 30 years of experience. She's an international civil servant and diplomat, professional legal mediator with excellent negotiating skills. She's a seasoned manager with entrepreneurial skills in both the public and private sectors, charismatic, warm, and energetic, attributes emanating from the multicultural background as a natural consequence of global citizenship. She's passionate about justice and a strong advocate of international judicial mechanisms and interstate cooperation to bring perpetrators to justice and justice to victims. Serving on various working groups of the ICC, which is the International Criminal Court, and international legal, legal institutions. She was born in the Netherlands, but she uh, revoked her Dutch nationality and is now a Ugandan. She's married with one son and two daughters. I want to fast forward down here. Uh, she's currently from 2012 to the present. She was ambassador and, and extraordinary to Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, and the European Union. And she's currently right now serving um, basically as one of Museveni's henchmen in the Ugandan uh, government. She cleans up for him and she makes things look good. Uh, and so Fazil, I wanted to um, discuss who this woman is and her, and her jurisdiction, given that she has the jurisdiction uh, to the Netherlands, Belgium, uh, Luxembourg, and the European Union. My question, um, my question is, what does her role um, in the Ugand in, in Museveni's uh, regime? How does that impact Ugandans who live within those different jurisdictions that she that she adjudicates? All right, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, when, when I was uh, making a, a bit of research about that lady, uh, you would find that uh, they go way back with Museveni in the eight, I think in the early nineteen eighties and something of that sort. Now, uh, what I understand very well, the way Museven operates is like he managed to cultivate uh, a very wide international network of individuals in one way or the other. Now, if you're talking about countries like the Netherlands, Da, I think is it Sweden as well, and Denmark and all those countries that she represents, uh, she is the fixer mm -hmm. uh, of the uh, Museveni's problems in that particular area, as well as the European Union. Now, Mirjam is part of a wider network of Museveni's connections in the diaspora. That is in the United States of America, as well as here in the UK, Canada, and all these other parts of the world. Now, in America, he uses one of the top lobbying firms 
in, in the United States. And that top lobbying firm is the one that also represents him here in the UK. Uh, because I, I don't want to discuss just Major Black as an individual, but I want to just to broaden it a wee bit for people to understand how, how he has cultivated this particular international network. Yes. Uh, because uh, the role of Black is, uh, you know, given her credentials as an international human rights lawyer, uh, we understand that Museveni, uh, you know, uh, whatever he did in northern part of Uganda, the war and all this kind of stuff, they really had him. Like they really literally had Museveni. And there is no way he would have survived the atrocities that the UPDF committed in northern Uganda and how he turned down efforts of negotiation with uh, Joseph Kony, thus prolonging the war and leading to, you know, more number of people being killed in one way or the other. And also the issue that happened in Kasese, where General Elelu went and massacred people in uh, the Mumbele Palace and all this kind of stuff. So this is where this lady comes in and fixes the International Criminal Court. And she negotiates with them and tells them that, look here, you want Kony, uh, we provided Vincent Oti and all these guys, but if at all you do convict Elero on ICC, sorry, if you convict Elero on Kasese murders, then uh, the issue of Kony, you know, you will not score on that particular front. So if you uh, let Elero go, uh, then uh, we shall give you more information about Connie and we shall give you more information on, uh, I think, the last gentleman. Is this last gentleman who was, who was, who was convicted uh, by the Ella uh, for his activities on, you know, with, with Joseph Connie. If you are following those two cases, you will see the handiwork of this uh, particular lady known as Miriam Black. And we also understand that she fixes Museveni. She works or she, she, she helps Museveni to acquire uh, in loans as well as grants in one way or the other. Literally whitewashing um, seven is atrocities by telling these people like, you know, look here, like, fine, he's corrupt, he has done this, he has done that, but, you know, he has done that, but not so much. It's not the worst. So if you don't give him money, just expect, you, you just look at what can happen when he's not there. So she's literally a sanitizer. She sanitizes everything and making sure that she gives these other governments, the Swedish government, the Danish government, and all these other European Union governments that, uh, you know, she makes them think that without Museveni, there's no other person that can bring stability in Uganda, that can help Uganda in one way or the other. So uh, she's one of those people, I believe, that uh, are deep uh, within Museveni's circles and for people who think that Museveni listens to the ministers the so-called special advice, those people they have no policy they have Museveni doesn't listen to anything from those particular individuals the only thing or the only people that Museveni listens to uh i don't know if my you guys can hear me or my image is fine yes uh, fine. we can hear you and see you all right all right, so what I was saying is that the only uh, people that uh, Museveni can actually listen to are these so-called, uh, what do you call these people? The lobbyists, as well as the, 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 the people like blacks and so on and so forth. Because they are the ones that, because you should understand how Museveni's government operates. It's a government that borrows every time. They survive on loans. Like he can borrow for everything. Like he, he, he gets, he, he's like someone who is on drugs. Like, you know, when you're on drugs and then you're addicted, that even when you don't need a shot, you really want to get those drugs to get high. Like that's how the government literally is. But for them, even if they don't need a loan, they will say, oh yeah, you just bring the loan. You, oh yeah, we shall take it, we shall take it, no problem. We don't need it, but we shall take it. So these are the people that help Museveni to acquire these loans and be able uh, to, 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 to maintain his patronage network that is really, really huge. And that's why you see our government, uh, one or two things when Museveni tries to convince people to join him, he always has to either give them a position in government as well as uh, either give them a lot of money. So that money has to come from somewhere. And in the end, Uganda is becoming very, very indebted. Secondly, that means that it's going to lead to a rise in taxes. It's going to lead to a rise in, uh, you know, printing more money and hence leading to inflation and all this kind of stuff. Now, the other thing, if you want to widen the entire thing, you, you should also look at the, you know, 
fixers in the UK as well, the people like the Lords, the Lord Popas and all these other people. And most of them were actually, you know, the people that were expelled during Amin's regime, the, the Indians that were expelled during Amin's regime, most of most of them settled here in the UK and others settled in Canada. Now when they settled in Canada, Museveni did a trick where he told them, no, 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 you guys come back to Uganda and get your properties. But when you come to get your properties, you just have to know that in return, you know, a quid pro, a quid pro quo kind of situation, that when you return, I give you your properties, which is good, but you should be able to influence those particular governments to look at me as a benevolent leader of Uganda in one way or the other. Because that's why you see, what whatever Museveni does, they can never, even if he steals as much money as possible, they can never take away the funding that they are giving him. They never, can never cut the funding. They can never do anything for him. They are the first people to congratulate him and all this kind of stuff, which is really interesting. And that is happening in Canada as well as countries like the United States of America. Sorry, the countries like the United Kingdom. Now, the pressure that has been in the U.S. has been so, so tremendous to the extent that maybe the U.S. is trying to uh, as well, you know, trying to reconsider its options on Museveni in one way or the other. And what we see is that uh, Museveni's intervention in Somalia has outlived its usefulness, and all of a sudden, the Ugandan troops have to withdraw from Somalia. And maybe they are looking for a deployment in Cabo Delgado, that is Mozambique, which is, of course, uh, very crowded today. So many countries are already deployed, so many countries are already there, and there isn't so much US intervention in Mozambique. And that's why you see that uh, it's more of a French intervention. But then the U.S. is also, uh, you know, trying to cut its, you know, spending or trying to look at Museveni as the regional power blocker in one way or the other. Now that means that the the mirage, mirage blacks of the U.S. have actually been uh, neutralized in one way or the, or the other for now, and that's why you see now Museveni is very, very angry with social media, especially what we are doing on Twitter and what we are doing on Facebook and what we are doing to protest in one way or the other, uh, hurting his so-called tourism industry where he has invested a lot of money, hurting his every project that he is bringing up in one way or the other. Because Museveni's biggest financer is the United States. If you can hurt the United States, because I understand black doesn't have a lot of influence in the US, so if you can hurt the United States, you... You, 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 you cripple. Yeah, you cripple, and also you his his resource base, you make it a wee bit much smaller, uh, whereby he won't be able to pay all that big military, the special forces command, his so-called uh, private military, he won't be able to pay his entire patronage network, and so on and so forth. But we also know that uh, uh, countries like Israel are coming in, whereas they're not giving him money, but they are actually giving him weapons uh, that are sophisticated and all, you know, the technologies for spying and all this kind of stuff. And what is very interesting, whereas I'm discussing Mirage and Black, but I'm just broadening it to show you his international network of individuals that are working in different countries in order to help him get this money. Now, there is the I would like to end with this point, but uh, the issue of China, because China has been providing a lot of loans to African countries, but now what we are seeing is that the Chinese policy on the continent is actually uh, changing in one way or the other. Gone are the days when China used to bring a lot of money, give it to African governments to construct roads, railways, airports, docks, and ports, and all this kind of stuff, because what they are seeing is the Chinese, they are not having a return on investment. Uh, the China used to have the FOCAC uh, conference where the, where African governments go for the, that meeting and they sit, also known as the begging trip of African leaders, where they go to China and decided to beg. But uh, of recent, uh, the, these begging trips, they are actually coming back uh, empty-handed in one way or the other. Uh, all that the African governments are left with, Uganda inclusive, is the loans or the Chinese loans that they are now struggling to actually pay back. Now, what the Chinese are doing right now is they are negotiating on the initial loans that they gave these countries, especially Uganda. So that is where they are holding, and they are saying, okay, if you're not giving us business, if you're not giving us uh, the minerals and all this kind of stuff, we are going to twist you more on the loans that we gave you initially, and we are not adding you any more loans. So that is what is happening. So Museveni doesn't have, he, he doesn't want to run to China, he doesn't want to run anywhere else. Uh, fortunately, I listened to his speech today, and when he was speaking about human rights, I even laughed 
I just knew that whatever Museveni's fixers in the diaspora, the Blacks and Company, the Poppers in London, as well as the the, 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 the the lobbyist companies in America and all these other countries, it seems that we are actually cashing up because Museveni's uh, so-called uh, speech today has been very fascinating. That saying, oh, policemen, you should not beat people, you should not kill people, you should not do this, you should not do that. But we know he's the very same person who preaches that and he does the entire opposite. But we know whenever he says such kind of things, he wants them to go on record so that they can release more money. Mm -hmm. Now, if at all Museveni was not worried about human rights and he was not being under pr pressure to speak about human rights and to bring people who commit human rights atrocities to the book, then he should not have said that particular speech. And that means that the Chinese loans could still be coming. He would have an alternative and say, okay, you don't want me to, you don't want to give me the loans, no problem, I'll go to China. But he can't run to China because the Chinese have changed their policy in one way or the other. So to write this up on Miss Lady, Miss Lady Black, what we have to do is to bombard Twitter, to expose her, and to let the world know, because she is Museveni's sanitizer, some sort of a fixer in the diaspora. Because she, she, this lady has no regard to human life. She has no regard to anything. All she wants is money, 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 money. And that's it. Speaking to a friend of mine recently, she told me that, oh, we should speak to people like Black and all this kind of stuff. Um, I told this person that, look here, if Black really doesn't see what is wrong with Uganda, what is happening in Uganda, I don't think there's anything in this world that you can speak to that lady in terms of, you know, telling her what she should be doing right. That she, if there's nothing in this world that you can tell her that she doesn't know. And for all that she knows, if she has refused to change, if she has refused to speak the truth and stand with the people of Uganda, then all we have left to do is to fight our battles the best way we know how to fight them. Go out there on Facebook, go out there on Twitter, go out there on social media and expose this lady. Because it is Museveni who always saying, oh, colonialists, colonialists, these white people, white people. And at the same time, in his cabinet and his ambassador diplomatic portfolios, he's having white people like Madame Mirajam. So it is really ironic for Museveni to be saying most of those words. So uh, I think that's my uh, submission to this lady, but we, we, we just have to keep pushing. And according to Museveni's speech today, he is actually much wounded than I expected. Good. Wow, Good. thank you. Thank you here. so much, Fazel. Uh, dear viewers, uh, this is the time you can, uh, we can take a few callers, a few questions for Fazel. Uh, the number is 978-413-6249. Uh, it's on WhatsApp. Feel free to call in and ask your question and give us your comment. This is the You Voice and we want to hear from you because it's all about your voice. So Fazil, you've taken us to the last portion of our show where we... So our show is not just uh, about pleasantries, about letting people know what's happening, but we empower people to take an action. So you're really driving this conversation along. Um, and so we get to the part of the show where there are action steps for our viewers to take, uh, whether it's tweeting, whether it's writing to their senators or um, representatives in, this, in their states. Um, that's just here in the U.S., but people from all, you know, all walks of life, from other parts of the world. What are the actions, and you touched just a little bit of, on them, about tweeting. How does one expose um, Madam uh, Mirjam? Um, and how do how does the typical person uh, really continue to put pedal, the pedal to the metal in, you know, dis, 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 you can say, disassembling uh, the Ugandan regime, this uh, Museveni's regime? How do yeah. we go about doing it? What, what action steps do you see there are to take for our viewers? Sure. Uh, first of all, I would like to appreciate AI TV, uh, the platform. Uh, it's, it's a very wonderful platform. And uh, another platforms that are doing this kind of stuff and this kind of work, because most of the things that we talk about here, they won't be talk, they won't be spoke about on mainstream media and all this kind of yeah. stuff. Now, um, about that lady, uh, of course, there are so many. Uh, what I understand with, with the way Museveni works is there are people who work overtly and there are people who work covertly. Now, there are people who are literally underground. And whenever you expose those people that are working behind the scenes, <laughs> it, it, it uh, destabilizes Museveni's uh, 
uh, uh, uh, workings in one way or the other. I remember there is a lobbying firm that we went after. I've oh, forgotten yes. the name. Uh, Was it but, Mercury? Mercury? Yeah, Mercury. Yeah, Mercury. Yeah. <laughs> we were really, really hard on Mercury. And they started blocking us. Like, they were literally blocking us. Then they, he had another fake uh, lobbyist that he hired. And uh, that lo actually Machile had one of the lady who was handling the Ugandan case. Uh, I think she's Irish. She actually had to drop it and they had to get another person. Mm -hmm. So we all didn't understand how the lobbying world works for the past 35 years. We all didn't understand how all these things work. We all didn't know about Mirage and Black and her role. But now she is known. Uh, we just had to, you know, go on uh, her tweets, go on uh, um, uh, the, 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 the embassies and all this kind of stuff, and keep uh, throwing as much tweets as possible, like we did with Machule and all these other uh, individuals that we went hard after. Some people sit there and say that oh, social media doesn't work, social media this and that. It's the, it, people should understand, unless if you don't know how it works then you can be you can be excused for saying that social media doesn't work now for people like those ones the so-called mirage and blacks we should be, we should bring them out in the limelight and show the people of northern uganda we show the people who who were in the kasese mass killings who lost their people their whatever who lost their people in the kasese massacre a genocide we should tell these people that look here the reason as to why you people did not get justice is because of this lady She's Museveni's fixer in the ICC. The reason as to why the people of northern Uganda, where Salim Saleh is now camped for over two years, it is because the reason as to why the people of northern Uganda did not get justice, being put in camps for over 10 years, not being given food, they are, by the time they left the camps, their land was taken away. And all of a sudden, they are saying that it is only Kony that committed atrocities. But Museveni's government also committed atrocities. The UPDF committed atrocities. And no one is talking about the atrocities of the UPDF. Why? It is because of Mirajan Black. She's the one blocking all these kind of things. Literally, she's the one. So we need to be able to connect all these circumstances, all these things that are happening in Uganda and the role of this particular lady, and then throw it out there on Twitter. I know she's because the good thing with the good thing with this battle is NRM doesn't have people who fight for it, especially on social media. So when you go hard on people like Black, she 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 doesn't have like an, an army of people who are going to counteract what you're saying, right? So she will be she's gonna be overwhelmed. Two things are likely to happen. Either seven will drop her or she will throw in the towel because even Edge has actually caught up with her. So we just have to be hard on her. She has to be trending for the wrong reasons. That's right. Thank you so much. I just want to um, spell out her name for those of us who are um, new to hearing her name. Her name is Mirjam. It's probably it's Miriam. Um, it, probably in Dutch, M-I-R-J-A-M, and you spell her last name B-L-A-A-K dash so, S-O-W, Mirjam Black So. She is the um, cleanup lady for Museveni. So wow. you know Thanks. what to do. Thank you so much, Judy. And uh, Fazil, uh, one last one from me. Uh, what would you tell the Ugandan government, the regime, concerning Lumbuya Fred and other bloggers and other activists, what would be your final message to the regime, then to the people in the diaspora and to the Ugandans back home? So those three categories of people. But let's begin with the regime. <laughs> well, uh, I think the regime, uh, the, uh, for lack of a better statement, I would tell them that we are coming. When we are coming hard for them, they are done one of the worst mistakes in the world going after someone who doesn't agree with you in a foreign country abducting them kidnapping them and trying to murder them is one of the worst things you can do especially because we know what has been happening in turkey uh, the jamal Khashoggi's case and all this kind of stuff but if the turkish government is also involved in this i think uh, it is really going to hurt them i always uh, reflect back to the issue of george floyd uh, I think it was uh, the, refer the Reverend Jesse Jackson. He said that, uh, I, I won't paraphrase because uh, I forgot the word, but what, what he made a statement in a sense that he said that whereas people might bring up Mr. Floyd's past, 
trying to tarnish him, trying to say that he was not a perfect person in the society and all this kind of stuff. Jesse Jackson said that, yes, it is, uh, as, a, as a spiritual believer, he said that, yes, God uses people that you would see as imperfect in the society, he uplifts them and uses them to awaken the so-called all perfect people within uh, a, you know, a community or a society. And that's the same thing that happened with Floyd. That, well, as Freud, people might say that he was imperfect, this and this and that, that kind of stuff. We saw that the amount of awakening that he created within the American atmosphere is really, really very, very interesting. And the same thing is happening to Fred. They might like to tarnish his name, they might try to concoct uh, words against him and all this kind of stuff. But if Rumbia does not surface and he doesn't, he does not turn up, and hurt and all this kind of stuff, uh, trust me, it's not going to look good for Museveni and all your counterparts. And no one is going to forget this moment in time in your reign uh, or your bloody reign of Uganda. Now for our brothers and sisters in the diaspora, the thing that we have to do is we have to be very careful. The things we do these days, Museveni's cells are now activated. The money is no longer being given in Uganda. The money is now moving in the diaspora. This is. For me, my understanding on how Museveni is now working, his cells within the diaspora are now working, trying to look out for bloggers, trying to look out for people who speak about stuff, commenters, and all this kind of stuff. And uh, for argument's sake, if we say that he pulled this off in Turkey, he's most likely to go to other destinations, and maybe South Africa, Kenya, and all these other countries. Because most people look at it and think, oh, haha, it is Lumbuye they are after. Me, I'm safe in London, I'm safe in America, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, I don't believe that you can be safe, <clears throat> whereas even me, I'm very careful every day if I'm leaving home, I have to check under my car and <laughs> do all sorts of things. I have to see if no one is following me, you know, just to take those precautions. So I also empower people in the diaspora to take the precautions because the cells have been activated. But I would also like to tell you that uh, you don't have to be scared. Because at the end of the day, uh, we are more stronger and more powerful than they are. They cannot arrest all of us. They cannot kill all of us. When someone is being taken away, we should be ready to pick up the gun and then continue fighting on. I'll end with this. I'm a very big movie fan. I think this, the movie was called uh, Enemy at the Gates by Jude Law. And uh, they, they went to fight in, in Russia. And the the, 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 the the side that the allies were fighting on, they didn't have enough guns and bullets. So whoever was given a gun, uh, if you got a gun, you never got bullets. <laughs> so what the people who were handing out the guns and bullets were saying, like, if someone is killed, you pick up the gun and look for the bullets and you continue forward. If you do not have the bullets, if you see someone dead with the gun, pick up the gun and use the bullets. If you have the gun without the bullets, if you see someone dead with the bullets, pick up the bullets and you continue fighting. That's how hard, but that's how you fight a dictator. So if one of us is taken away, if one of us is being captured, if one of us is being killed, if one of us is being changed or subdued, we always have to pick up that gun, look for the bullets and continue to fight on. Or you pick up the bullets and look for the gun and continue to fight on. So my message is that we are we are right on the money, but we have hurt the gentleman, and that is why he is coming after us. If we are not relevant at all, and if we are not doing any dent to his regime, definitely he wouldn't be coming after us. Mm -hmm. To some extent, I wouldn't like to say this in bad faith, but if I see someone coming after me, I know that there is someone re something really, really I'm doing that is right. And that really empowers me and encourages me to push on much stronger. So I'd like to end with those particular. Uh, wow, thank you. Thank you so much, Fazil Mayanja, all the way from UK, a political analyst, activist, blogger. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. And it's been really wonderful. Uh, very, very touching message. If you don't have the bullets, uh, pick up the gun. If you have the gun, look for the bullets, but let's keep fighting. Whatever you got to do, keep going forward, keep moving forward. Judy, your final remarks and then we'll... Well, first I want to say thank you so much for everything that you do, Fazil, um, and for the courage to speak truth to power um, and putting your life at risk. Because uh, as you said, you have to be very mindful and very careful when you're going out and about that there is nothing underneath your car, that nobody's following you. So this isn't just 
hiding behind a camera. Um, so thank you for, for who you are and your contribution to the struggle and everything that you're doing. And thank you for also being with us today. You could have been doing anything else, but you stayed here with us to, um, to have this important conversation. So thank you again. Uh, to our viewers, uh, thank you also again for being with us, for their struggle, for all of the people who contributed to the, mm. to the fundraising for Lumbuye's um, legal fees. We thank you for, for, for giving what you, what you had to give and for really making a difference. Um, yeah, we're going to just keep yeah, updating as the, as the updates are coming and we're just going to keep moving forward. And Judy, mm. uh, I know our producer, I would like to dedicate the song. I think our producer will be able to get it. Uh, Situka to Tumble by Bobby Wine. Uh, th th that song that says, uh, rise up and let's keep moving. It's discouraging all around, but let's keep going. Uh, that song, if uh, Sean, our producer, if you could get for us that song, what a nice way to end the show. But uh, Judy, don't you want to talk about the NUP retreat? I know it has yes. been covered by the Lumbuya story, but we need to keep reminding That's our people right. that there is an upcoming NUP first ever diaspora retreat that is coming in September 24th, 26th. 24th through the 26th here in Boston. Yeah. Uh, I think we may have a flyer. If we don't, it is the 24th through the 25th of September. That's a Friday, Saturday, and then a Sunday. Uh, it's our first ever retreat. Mm -hmm. We're going to have musicians there. We're going to have people from the diaspora. Uh, sadly, we will not be having uh, our, our comrades coming in from Uganda due to uh, constraints at the, em at the Ugandan embassy with yeah. visas and things like that. Um, but we're going to be, again, continuing to share uh, up updates on the retreat. Uh, it's happening the 24th through the 26th of, of September here in Boston area. Hmm. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, dear viewers, thank you so much for tuning in and for being with us. You've been very wonderful viewers. And next Saturday again, same time, on behalf of uh, us at U Voice, I'm David Chilavia. And I'm Judy Bukenia. Have a very good night. Thank you, our producer Sean and our editor Ethel. Good night. <laughs> Musiteri changuru gendolo wambu Situka tukende mumasu Situka tutambule Embera emara mama njina Etoko watu gende Situka tutambule 